The Oblates of St. Augustine was founded by Father John Melnick, formerly a member of the Order of St. Augustine and of the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. Father John's dream was to defend and preserve the traditional Augustinian charism against the attacks from modernist bishops seeking to destroy the traditional Catholic faith and religious life. Beginning during the months in 2020, when Catholic bishops made it nearly impossible to attend Mass and receive the last rites, Father John founded the Oblates of St. Augustine to preach the traditional Catholic faith, provide the sacraments according to the traditional Roman rite, and live the traditional Augustinian religious life to merit grace for the world. Living a mendicant charism, the Oblates of St. Augustine is supported entirely by the alms of its generous benefactors. You can visit our website to learn more about how you can support this mission at www.westonmonks.org. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The passage from this letter to the Corinthians that precedes the one we read today is read aloud on the Sunday of Septuagesima. St. Paul reminds the Corinthians, those, are, those that are in the city of Corinth, about the Exodus, that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt, by a pillar of cloud, crossing the Red Sea, and into the desert. The crossing of the Red Sea was a figure of baptism. The manna that they were fed in the desert, a prefigurement of the Holy Eucharist, and the water that gushed forth from the rock was a symbol of grace, a prefiguration of the grace that we were to receive when everything had been fulfilled. Today, St. Paul reminds us of how the Jews had turned their backs on our Lord despite all the good things shown to them by Almighty God, all the good thing, things done to them by Almighty God. That although he gave them the blessing of the law, they still created for themselves a golden calf. Although they were given manna, unlimited bread from heaven, they still desired to eat meat. The Jews were never satisfied with what they had, with what they were given by God. And so they constantly sought their happiness in other places. This is precisely what we do when we sin. We don't trust that God's law will make us happy. Instead, we search for happiness elsewhere. But even after we search for happiness in these things, we're left with a guilty conscience. We're, th we're left with mere, with mere pleasure or entertainment that at the end of the day, the, the enjoyment that we receive from these things goes away, goes away and disappears, leaving us empty once again. Our desire for happiness is everlasting. Therefore, the only thing that can satisfy it is something that is everlasting. Nothing in this world can satisfy it, only God. The gospel today speaks of our Lord looking at Jerusalem, weeping over it, because it had become everything contrary to what our Lord had hoped, what God had hoped when he had started to reveal the covenant, the covenants with Israel. It had become, his house had become a den of thieves. This past week in the office of Matins, the, uh, the prayers that religious and priests are obligated to pray, Holy Mother Church gave us the scriptures from uh, the third book of Kings. After Solomon, the kingdom of Israel had split into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. The king that ruled the southern was Rehoboam, and the king that ruled the northern was Jeroboam. Now, Jerusalem was in the sunder. It was in the, kingdom, in the southern kingdom. It was in the kingdom of Judah. And Jeroboam, the kingdom of the north, king, the king of Israel, was afraid that a lot of the Jews would defect and go down to the south because the temple was there where, where they were to worship. So Jeroboam did something dumb. In two cities, Bethel and Dan, he created temples of the state, in which case he erected two golden calves, two different idols, one in Bethel and one in Dan, so that the Israelites would worship there. 
The consequence that he had to suffer, a prophet came to tell him, was that his son would die. God was not very pleased with Jeroboam. One of my favorite readings is the prophecy that we hear on Holy Saturday, the 12th prophecy. The, the Jews are in exile. This is much after the time of the splitting of the, of the two kingdoms, about 400 years after. The Jews are in exile, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king, creates an idol and demands that everyone in his kingdom fall down and worship that idol. But he hears of three guys who, who um, will not. And their names are Sidrak, Misak, and Abdenego. And it comes with a be- very beautiful chant. It's one of my favorite chants uh, during Holy Week. But these three young men are not afraid of the fire that they're threatened with. King, ne- King Nebuchadnezzar threatens them with a fire seven times the fire that they usually murder people with, they kill people with, punish people with. But they're not afraid, saying that if God wishes them to die by this fire, then they're resigned to die. But nevertheless, their God can bring them through that fire. So the king's servants create this fire, and the fire instead engulfs the servants. And the three men, who were firm in their principle, firm in their fear of God, and firm in their love of God, were left unharmed, praising the Lord. I mention this today because this was the example This was the example our our Lord had hoped that Israel would continue to follow. He performed these miracles precisely to encourage the Israelites that he is their God. He still still wants their good. But the temporal good of of surviving a fire doesn't, doesn't even compare to the salvation that our Lord grants to our souls, our eternal souls. So our Lord weeps over Jerusalem, yes, because of material idols that they created for themselves, but more so because they constantly refuse to give God the love that he so eagerly desires from each and every single one of us. I would dare to say that today, one of our greatest idols, like in the time of Jeroboam, are two. But, but unlike then, they're not golden calves. Instead, I fear that the, the, the greatest religion in our country in particular is not Christianity, but rather politics. And it, too, is divided into two kingdoms. Oftentimes you see people using the gospel to support whatever uh, material world, whatever earthly Jerusalem they desire to create around them. Of course we all want a temporal form of peace. But the peace that our Lord constantly asks us to seek, the peace that Jerusalem, city of peace, was meant, was not a mere earthly Jerusalem, an earthly city of peace, but a heavenly one, an eternal one. Because we're material creatures, we often do get bogged down by our attachments, our attachments to a, a comfortable life. And because of this attach, these attachments that we have to our comfortable life, we often sacrifice principles. In the early, in the early church, many Christians were tempted by the Roman emperor to just offer just a little, a little pinch of incense, and they can go free. A little pinch of incense, and think how much good you can do to your neighbor. Just offer that little bit of a pinch of incense. But with introspection, we could probably see that oftentimes in order to gain material comforts, the promise of of an earthly Jerusalem, so to speak, in our own nation, we're offering more than just a pinch of incense. We're constantly sacrificing principles in order to to try to, in hopes of achieving something else. I'll be honest, our Lord was not crucified for cheaper groceries and cheaper gas prices. He was crucified to win your heart So let us take this week and meditate on this gospel from St. Luke, according to St. Luke. Looking interiorly at us, asking ourselves, asking our Lord, asking the Holy Holy Ghost to enlighten us about what what am I sacrificing? What what am am I, what what principles am I renouncing because of an earthly attachment? What attachments do I have to this earth? And what instead should I be giving to God in order to demonstrate, in order to honestly offer him a pure and spotless heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.